is what I was doing last time. Um, and I started talking about uh, measurements. And uh, then I got to here and basically I stopped. And my discussion here was uh, discussing causation and correlation. And uh, one thing that I didn't show you, and the next time I will show you, uh, many of our studies today have uh, basically run correlations of everything with everything. And uh, this is kind of the gift of big data. And why do I say this is a gift of big data? Is that you can collect a lot of data without too much effort. And so you just throw them all in. And, you know, I see Abby doing audit quality studies with 30 variables or something like that. And I see Sophia using 50 variables in uh, our Chinese study. And, uh, you know, in the old past, we, you, we didn't do that because you didn't have the data. And so now this is kind of uh, a new way to look at the world. Uh, but I don't think we really developed the statistics and a good way to deal with it. And I think this will take a while to do that. And this is not only in auditing research or in accounting research. It's really in all research um, that uh, have this problem of, uh, you know, okay, now you have, have a lot of data. What do you do with it? And uh, these actually are, are thoughts that uh, we have been developing over time um, uh, for auditing, but it really applies everywhere. And the question is, if two variables correlate, um, what does that mean? And could basically be three things or more. One is that both of them are related to an underlying effect, like there is a growing world population. Therefore, the number of colds in uh, Australia are correlated to the number of colds in the United States. Okay? Uh, or, and then you say, oh, it can be contagion from one country to the other, except, of course, could be something like that, but that's pretty remote. Um, so that, that's one thing. The other thing is the correlation could be purely spurious. Just happened that those two phenomena um, are growing at a similar clip or reverse clip or et cetera, et cetera. And the third thing, so one, uh, one is an underlying factor, factor. The other one is just luck or bad luck. And the third one, however, there is a causality. And that's what you are really looking for. It says one creating the other. And the question that you ask when you run these correlations is, are we in this third effect? And uh, this is actually, there is a lot of research to be done to, to deal with that. Okay. Uh, and uh, this is actually, I mentioned it last time. Uh, this is... Um, uh, w was a big thing about uh, about Google flu trends um, predicting better uh, pandemics. In this case, one pandemic was flu uh, flus in the United States than the CDC, and uh, it was very interesting. It came out in the New York Times this, and then people started uh, knocking it. I mentioned this last time start knocking it, saying, well, you know, it's obviously in New York, there'd be more colds than in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. But then, then people kind of, uh, the New York Times improved the statistics a little bit and normalize it by population. And actually today with the pandemic numbers, we see a lot of normalization. Uh, typically, they are presenting data on 75,000 people or, or 100,000 people, so they normalize by population. And then uh, when they normalized their flu trends, it was very clear that pharmacy purchases or queries in Google were very highly correlated with, uh, uh, with the colds that people were having, uh, influenza-like symptoms. And, um, it, and then you thought about this, and this is really 
uh, actually the story of most, most of the times. You find an effect and then you kind of go back and say, explain the effect and say, well, I should have known this in advance. You know, um, a Yoon study on using weather data for, for predicting sales of a large retailer. Uh, it took us about a couple of years to get to that point of using weather data as exogenous variables to predict sales. And, but when we actually got the results, including weather in it, <coughs> uh, was pretty clear that, you know, you think about Florida, you think about hurricanes, you think about the Northeast, like today, and you think about storms, snowstorms. And then you talk about, Florida, you think about California, you worry about heat, you worry about some other things. So you would expect that sales of stores will be affected by that, but wouldn't be year-wide, will be uh, seasonal, meaning there is a hurricane season in Florida. So ex post facto, you can say, oh, yeah, this guy, we call it in sports, Monday morning quarterbacking. You are thinking about football and you say, well, yesterday we should have thrown the ball because that guy was free, meaning hey, that does a lot of good. And uh, thinking about it, um, you know, maybe we should do a little bit more ex, ex ante theorizing and uh, would improve this. But, you know, it's difficult. But it's, um, it's very interesting uh, to, to think that uh, clearly Google searches will indicate some degree of um, correlation or prediction of what the CDC is going to say and uh, would indicate codes. Now, th there is a book uh, called Everybody Lies. And this book about, is about a guy who was got a PhD from Harvard in economics, and then he went to work for Google. And basically, it was like looking at uterances in Google. And he says, if you have a chance to read this, I actually have some slides in everybody. I'll, I'm going to send it to you. And, you know, one, interest, one of the things that um, struck me reading that book um, was, you know, like he says that people write confessions to Google. I hate my wife or things like that. I love my dog, uh, et cetera. And I never really thought that anyone would do that, but that's, that's what he picks up on trends. And then the second thing, he was looking uh, at the election of Donald Trump. And uh, actually the queries uh, didn't reveal what, uh, what the polls were revealing on prediction. And the polls were very wrong because the polls basically said that uh, Hillary was going to win easily and finish up that she lost. And the two reasons that uh, they didn't say, first, they were right. She got more popular votes. Second reason, they were wrong because they didn't balance uh, the number of electoral votes that the state would have and a couple of other, other things. But it was very interesting. Uh, thinking, uh, and then he kind of, uh, that is this software, and I had, I think Andrea, when she was doing our PhD, her PhD here, I had her play with Google Trends. And Google Trends basically looks at the frequency of queries, and there is some limitation of what you can do, but it's quite interesting. And uh, turns out, turns out that if you looked at at uh, people saying Hillary versus Trump or Trump versus Hillary. Uh, you could predict better what they were going to vote than any other way of prediction. It's just the order of query. Very interesting because I don't know if this is totally, uh, totally crazy, or there was real, there is a real causality behind it. But that's what he said. And actually, it's worthwhile having a look at that book. 
And it's a popular book, it's not an academic book, but the guy is very good. And the book is very entertaining. And uh, makes you think a lot about uh, relationships, correlations. Um, and the other thing that you need to think a lot about is what will be the effect of exogenous data on research and on, uh, on pretty much many phenomena. Because uh, people keep talking about, about big data and they think about sophisticated analysis and etc. And actually, um, the advent of big data is really a first visible simple phenomenon. Second is the creation of data that did not exist before in volume. And third is the creation of sensors, measurements that didn't exist before, meaning sensors of motion, sensors of temperature, uh, sensors of smell, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you could have a, one measure or two, not a uh, hundred million. And so uh, the, the, I always think that uh, uh, the most important thing in audit research uh, for the future is being able to use that data, uh, this large set of data, basically to confirm um, values that a company is disclosing. Um, and that, that's even fallacious in one sense, because the reporting model is so weak at this moment. Now, you heard me talk about this the first day, but I'm going to repeat. Um, uh, Baruch Lab's research, and all the people, obviously, uh, basically shows that uh, in the times of Ball and Brown, meaning in the late 60s, where the market research started, um, the relationship between earnings and other accounting variables and the valuation of a company was 40 to 60% adjusted as squared. Okay, so there was uh, accounting numbers had a strong effect on valuation of companies. Well, Baruch, uh, Baruch book, The End of Accounting, uh, basically says that now the values are something like 4 or 5%. That's not a surprise to me. I've been saying this for a while. And because I see all this, uh, meaning for a while, we didn't have separate AIS. So I, I spent a lot of time attending these, the accounting seminars, uh, which I still do to a certain degree. And then you know, I was start, I was startled by how low were the significant COVID, the significant regression results. I would say, wow, four percent, five percent, six percent, and basically is, a, is this phenomenon that uh, that uh, the relationship of accounting numbers and valuation went in different directions. And why is that? because businesses do different things today. And um, in the Pacioli times, what, you, what mattered is really inventory, maybe proper tax equipment, but they didn't measure very much of that. But inventory, division of profit, uh, and uh, where inventory was in the supply chain, and that. Those were the four things that mattered. Today, you know, you don't think, meaning how much inventory does Google have? How much inventory does Microsoft have? So that really doesn't make sense. But matters is other things like uh, brand, uh, uh, positioning, virtual products, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and these things can be valued by exogenous variables to a certain degree. And so I think auditing will be changing uh, dramatically towards exogenous variable valuation. Uh, and it's not going to be only auditing, which is basically a verification process. It's well going to be a lot of business processes will be measured that way. So uh, I think Baruch is right. You know, you know, you need other forms of information. Now, Baruch's book in the first four chapters, basically 
uh, basically finishes up with a number like 5%. That's what uh, uh, today's financial statements explain in valuation. Um, that's 15. But then at the second part of his book, he looks at special industries like uh, pharmaceuticals, oil and gas. And he says, well, if you add these other values like reserve in oil and gas, patents on pharmaceuticals, you can improve this explanation. But he didn't improve it that much, improve it to a certain degree. And why? Because Baruch is a very old fashioned guy. And uh, he was using just kind of traditional things in financial statements. I think someone needs to do the research using exogenous variables of different types if they can get hold of it. So that was kind of my, my discussion uh, of uh, emerging value of uh, exogenous variables. And of course, you could pick up, you know, 20 or 30 exogenous variables, uh, large quantities of it, and use it for many, many, uh, many, many purposes. And back to what I said last time, and I think uh, is important to think about this a little bit, um, is in the old days, how did you do research? And uh, guys, I see this today in the A journals, an obsession with, with this old way of thinking. But how did you do research? And I mentioned even Janine Klaufman last time. Uh, you basically read the literature, so you anchored it. And based on what the literature said, you developed your theories. And so all papers finish up with a big literature review, and they say, based on this, I think this. That's the hypothesis. And then at that time, you did the minimum possible data extraction. Why? Because extracting the data, picking up the data, was horrendously busy. I mentioned Janine spent a year and a half collecting the venture collection, uh, the venture conversions. Okay, and uh, imagine if every time you did a market study, you would have to go and pick up, you know, the 10,000 listed companies. Now they are much less, like three or 4,000 listed companies. Their financial statements go only 10K, manually collect the uh, three, four, five, pieces of information you needed, put it on a spreadsheet, and do the analysis. You would be here getting your doctorate for 20 years. Okay, and so these kind of things like CompuStat showed up and changed totally the direction of research because it was easier to do market research. And you could do a lot of things, but you still did the same kind of thing. Read the literature, create the hypothesis, then test the hypothesis with gathering the data. Now, then the phenomenon, uh, 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 phenomenon happened. And I, I actually was very, uh, struck by this a while ago. Uh, I was at that time consulting for the FASB. And, uh, it was a project that, uh, I did with Sandy Burton, who was the dean at Columbia, but was very famous accountant. He was chief, he was chief accountant of the SEC. Uh, he was vice mayor for finance of New York. Uh, and then he was in the business school was in the, in the, was in the accounting department with me. And we basically built database on FASB 33, which was the inflation accounting statement and FASB 36, 37, which were the pension accounting databases. And this was the first time that the FASB went into the business of creating databases. And I built this database. And the other consultant on this was a guy that you will recognize the name, I think, a guy called Bill Beaver from Stanford. And I think I last time mentioned, Bill Beaver was the only guy that we found in our research that had an A publication every year. And Bill already retired and et cetera, but he was a fantastic guy. Um, and him and his PhD student decided to do a study 
on inflation accounting using my database. My database, FASB database that I had developed. So they started doing that study and they ran hundreds of regressions and finish up choosing a few and publishing it. Um, in the John of Accounting Research, ja, because Bill can get in anywhere you want. Uh, but the interesting thing about this is that they ran thousands of regressions, meaning I know that because I used to get calls from his PhD student asking me for this and for that uh, on the data. And then they chose what they were going to include. And I sent everyone, uh, maybe two days ago, uh, Jim Olson's presentation, and this is a kind of modernity that you guys are going to have to live with it, maybe you, you haven't, uh, haven't yet realized, is uh, it was a seminar in Cairo. And uh, this guy, I, uh, Mohammed something, uh, got the seminar going, and there may be 80 or 100 people on the seminar. And he managed to get Shem Sunder that's going to be speaking here on Friday, Jim Olson, all these kind of luminaries to talk in the seminar. And so what Jim Olson was, was talking about is about the weakness of t-tests and the regression data in research. And he was talking about screen picking. <laughs> and I thought it was a funny expression of someone that is not very computer literature. But uh, this is basically you run thousands of regressions like Bill Beaver did. And then you choose the ones that fit your theory. Okay, that's one way to, do, to see it. The other way to see it is going the other way and say you build your theory out of what you found in those regressions. But you see, this is the question that I think we are going to face uh, in future research is we are going to face this difficulty of uh, how do we come up with a method of understanding real phenomena with theory? Because the old method is not the good method. Just read the literature, uh, create hypotheses, and collect the least data you can is not going to be the way. And so actually a, a few years ago, um, I remember, I, I remember this, uh, John Tukey, as I mentioned before, and his exploratory data analysis, and I uh, convinced Chilu to do a dissertation in EDA. And EDA is one of the ways, uh, is one of the ways to deal with this large amount of data. So I, the screen picking in Jim's term, he was very derogatory of the whole thing. And uh, he's old fashioned. He was thinking about building a theory and et cetera, et cetera. And I don't think we have a resolution of this, but you are in the generation. You do a lot of screen picking. Uh, and maybe you can do what we call exploratory data analysis into what we call confirmatory data analysis. And this whole idea of correlations and relating data is a very nice way to come up with building a theory. Remember, I mentioned also the problem of overfitting. Problem is that you create theories out of screen picking, create theories out of what you see on the data. But the moment you do that, uh, you have the problem of testing your theory against the data that you just used to construct it. The easy way to resolve that is keep a holdout sample and build a theory with one part of your population, test it with the other part of the population. But for example, if you're talking about, uh, about bankruptcies or you're talking about restatements, uh, I mean, there are not that many. And so the moment you hold out a sample, you are having problems there. And of course, there are techniques to deal with that, uh, to deal with that, uh, but uh, it, it's very difficult. And I'm sure you'll see that with Professor Kogan's course. 
But again, back to back to our discussion of uh, correlations. You need to build a theory. And it's not necessarily out of the literature, maybe out of the data, and that's okay. Although many old-fashioned researchers don't think is okay. I also mentioned last time that I, when I started formulating this with working with Chi, um, I said that to Alex, and I thought he was going to eat my head off, Alex Hogan, uh, because, you know, he's very conservative. But actually, he, he kind of said, yeah, that's what it is. Uh, and from other areas of literature, there are already people have developed 